Over what? You just get your desk. Oh. And we're live. Hello, Miniature Monthly. Hello. If you don't know me, I'm Christine Van Patten, and Aaron and Liz have allowed us to take over their channel today. <laughs> <laughs> Hijacked stream. Yeah. Um, so we are going to get started on uh, my set for next month which are going to be the Guardians of Valoria. Do you have the concept art for that? Ooh, probably. I'll bring that up here in a minute. Okay. Um, so I want to start this set slightly differently um, in that I want to get the Z-Spheres proportions for all the girls first thing. And then we'll dive into one particular character and start working on her uh, in a bit. But this right here is kind of my standard female Z-Sphere rig. Um, just very basic kind of like standard human size. Mm -hmm. So we're, gonna, we're going to vary this up uh, to represent each of the different girls. This one is actually, I'll probably keep this one for uh, Ophelia, who's our cleric. And she can kind of be our measuring stick for the others. Okay, so... We have symmetry on here. I found your concept art. Okay, great. Boom. So first I'm going to work on Nima, who is just to the right of our cleric character. She is going to be a little shorter and a little wider than Ophelia. There we go. Took me a second to get the reference art where it belonged. That's all right. She's going to have slightly shorter forearms, slightly shorter calves, and just be a little bit wider. Now, this set was largely inspired by a lacking in your current model range. Yes. Um, although I have lots and lots and lots of female characters in my line, uh, I had a significant lack of just regular human adventurer minis. By that, there's only one. And she isn't even that regular, or that I, uh, or that representative of your style in general. All right, yeah. uh, we have Zariah. Or I guess there are two. Zariah is pretty representative. I was thinking Guinevere. Mm, yeah. So then I'm going to go work on Fela next. She is tall and skinny. She has kind of the elongated limbs. So you're just going to work out the Z-Sphere rigs for all six of them? Yeah. I'm just going to get the proportions for all six of them knocked out, and then we can 
dive into one particular character to work on. Okay. But this way I know that there's significant variety between the different body shapes and yeah. styles. She has a much thinner hip structure. Not super muscular. Probably really exaggerate the Warner clock in the legs for this one. You'll probably have to in the big night girl. So probably a good idea to do it in this one also so it doesn't feel out of place, you know? Yeah, I also want to, like, move, like, make her torso itself a bit longer. She's a little go. taller anyway. Yeah, there we go. That's better. Uh, and then for Kinsley, she is like kind of fairy like. She's small and like she's short overall, but she's thin and kind of wafery. So she she's short like Nemo, but she doesn't have Nemo's like. Let's see. Let me drag the strength. concept art over where we can see that one. Kinsley. Okay. A little tracer ish. Yeah. Yeah. Except tracer is like really lo long and lanky with her legs. Mm -hmm. But the same kind of build structure in that she's small and wiry. Yeah. I'm definitely going to have to come down with the. Torso length, shorter arms here, or just smaller arms overall. Kinsley is a druid and she works with griffins. Ah, interesting. It comes slightly out with the hips, slightly in with the shoulders. Yeah, I like that. All right, so this is Kinsley. And then Tegan which is the, the big paladin girl in the center. She's going to be bigger overall. Much more uh, muscle, like a bodybuilder type. Slightly longer. Oh, that's a good idea. I forgot to. Do the announcement. Yeah, I'm doing it now. I got you. Announcements away. It's going to have much uh, wider shoulders than the other girls.
They notice that I don't really grow the knees very much when I'm changing these proportions because um, it doesn't really matter how much muscle you put on or fat you put on, the knee doesn't really get excessively larger. Uh -huh. So the, the leg will always taper there. With Tegan, I'm going to add an extra Z-sphere at the top for her. Now, her name wasn't on the concept art, but I assume she's the paladin-y looking one in the middle. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I actually had her name on there and then um, deleted a, a different layer. And I guess I had written the name on the other layer. <laughs> My bad. Zachariah said, it's like my sub expired itself. Ah, derp. I'm working and lurking today, by the way, so I'm chatting without sound. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for the lurking. Feet are kind of another one that I don't um, mess with too much unless they're like a different species or something. Or they're, or I know they're going to be wearing like really big boots or something like that. What do you mean you don't mess with too much? Uh, like for scaling, when I'm doing different proportions, I, I don't oh, really I mess with the feet too much because... Uh, one, I'm probably going to be sculpting boots or whatever over the feet anyway. And two, um, human feet generally aren't that different in size. Right. I mean, and you use that a little bit to lend scale, right? The hands, the feet, the hands a little bit. Sometimes those are bigger, but head size, feet size, bookend the mini and communicate the scale of the rest of the model. There's even Warhammer models have little tiny heads. Yeah. The space Marines have little tiny heads, not because they wanted to make lore, which is the popular opinion that these are, you know, giant suits of armor or whatever, but because in order to make these things look like they're nine feet tall, the heads have to be small. Otherwise, it just looks like a slightly larger scale mini of a normal sized person. Right. Feet are another way you do that, although in general feet are much larger than in reality because that's one of the ways that you make the small thing look like it's actually a large thing. So that's a complicated set of criteria to juggle there between giving you that uh, I'm looking at a full-size person from far away feeling on the tabletop. Yeah. And then balance that against, but this is a really tall person that I'm looking at from far away on the tabletop. So right now I'm just going to put in all of our girls the way that they are so I can double check that my proportions are reading the way that I want them to. I think Fela could be a little taller. Oh, I just realized you are only you only have five models so far for this month. Is that what we're uh, going to be doing, or do you have ideas for a sixth? Well, like I said, Kinsley is a druid, so I was considering doing like a small creature oh, to go I with like her yeah. as like a companion piece. Or a griffin. Or a small griffin, yeah. yeah. 
but I haven't designed that one yet. That makes sense. Zachariah says, woohoo to five. Companions, griffins. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I think... He says he's going to be excited about anything, to be honest. <laughs> What's got you so excitable, Zach? More fancy packages in the mail. <laughs> yeah. Now, Zach, I believe, is subscribed to uh, your book box tier, which is very limited. Can't make a whole bunch of those. Mm. I don't know why this isn't moving symmetrically. And he says, I am excited to see you guys at an irregular time. Yes, I am sub to those. Technically, this is supposed to be our regular time, but. <laughs> Don't always make it, but yes, this is supposed to be our regular time. Yeah. Life has been kicking us in the teeth lately for that kind of stuff. I don't know why it's not letting me do the arms symmetrically. That's annoying, but. Okay. That is weird. Oh, um, because you've moved it. Remember, you don't have, you have to turn on. I haven't moved it. This is the disease fear rig. I can't move it. If I try oh, to move it, it does this. I thought this was the, oh, so the others are not Z-sphere rigs. The others are important. The others are you put there for reference. Right, yeah. Uh, I'm sure that is a factor, having turned on, brought in other models, and it probably has changed the relational symmetry. Yeah, this one needed to be slightly taller. This one needs to be slightly taller. I think that's good. I think we can probably lengthen Fela's legs just slightly. Longer legs is always good if you can wiggle it in. For females. And yeah, she definitely has that most of her turned under for legs vibe in your concept sketch. Like, it looks like the bottom of her hips are starting where the top of the tank's hips are. You've given her long legs, which is good. <laughs> it, it makes her different than the others. And then little tiny torso. There we go. I think that's better. Yeah, we're glad to see you too, Zach. Nice to have people around. Absolutely. Okay, so Fela is actually the one that I want to work on today. Um, take a sip of my coffee. She is a warlock. Um, Pact of the Unicorn. And... Well, we were talking about warlocks and about kind of the personality type that goes with a warlock being very short-sighted um, and kind of instant gratification. Yeah. Class-wise, warlocks, right? If you look at their designs, I wanted to talk on this some, so I'm glad you segued into that, but I'm going to interrupt you before you jump onto the sculpt component of it. Uh Warlocks, it was an epiphany moment for me looking at the differences between warlocks and wizards and sorcerers in how each one of them is kind of designed from a philosophical standpoint. And if you're, if you're reading through it in 5e, wizards are the long-term planners. They are the ones that are all about hard work now for profit and benefit later. Sorcerers are kind of a mix. They're kind of in between, right? They... 
they have this innate power, but they're not necessarily short-sighted. They just kind of live day to day uh, as it comes, and they've always been able to handle the stuff because, well, they just have this innate gift. So they lack the effort and time into their craft that wizards put because it just comes naturally to them. Uh, not many people in real life have that, but sorcerers in D&D do. Um, so that comes with its own shortcomings. Each one of these has their own shortcomings, and I thought how they represented it is actually very, very clever. The, the wizards' long-term preparation kind of cost them a little bit in the short term. Lower levels, wizards are tend to be a little weaker. Uh, they don't have as... Um, robust of benefits early on, but in later game, it really starts to pan out, right? They start to get signature spells like Fireball that they can throw around at will. Warlocks never get anything that potent. Uh, but they're all about the long rest. The Sorcerer is half long rest, half short rest, right? They're just kind of, they're, they're the mixture of both. They don't get the intense benefit at late levels from long-term planning, but they're not handicapped uh, either short term. But warlocks are all about, from a, from a philosophy perspective, I have sacrificed everything ever uh, for my future, for right now, right this second. They get nothing out of a long rest that they don't get out of a short other than the standard hit dice. They are all about na the now. Right. They don't care. They sold their soul or they made some kind of a pact, traded something of themselves for power now. They are the instant gratification class. And models tend to fail to reflect that. That's a difficult thing to communicate. But when we were talking about the fact that there's no really good female warlock models out there, there are good male warlock characters out there. They kind of have an evil bent or whatever, and they kind of have that maniacal, short-term... Uh, personality conveyed the female ones aren't really that aren't pushed that far so that's what we want we want uh, the warlock to convey that and that's what I pitched at Christy and that triggered this response from Christy so go ahead babe yeah so I started thinking about okay well what kind of girl would make a pact like this and have this sort of mentality and I came up with this idea of like a very spoiled your browser is very off screen at the moment we can see like oh, one frame of it okay. uh, so I'm looking at like reference for Paris Hilton um, this very spoiled daddy will handle it kind of mentality like the uh, the girl from the white girl from Princess and the Frog Mm -hmm. and she's like I never get anything I wish for you know like just a very a bit self-centered and a bit um, just very short-sighted in that she she's not thinking about the future she just is thinking about now uh, Zach says I started building my short team painting queue and it definitely includes min Moonlight Minis in it which ones? We gotta know Yay. Uh, Zach says, OMG, we have the quintessential warlock in our D&D campaign. He literally killed an NPC that was going to be a new PC in our campaign, not once, but twice. <laughs> Valendar says, narf. And then Paris Hilton? Yes, very, very Paris Hilton in her um, kind of approach to life. I like the slightly wider shoulders, I think, but very bony. Mm -hmm. uh, Valen, uh, uh, Valendar says Paris Hilton question mark and then Zach says uh, oh my god that is the best description Paris Hilton is a warlock yes <laughs> Valendar says I don't know the white girl from PATF I don't, I don't know what that is is more spoiled sweet not spoiled rotten you know the uh, don't care now I want it now, like that girl, mm -hmm. but grown up. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just like spoiled. Oh, Princess and the Frog. That's what PATF is. Yeah, okay. Princess and the Frog. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's spoiled sweet, not spoiled rotten. But, I mean, a warlock doesn't necessarily have to be rotten because there are warlocks that have sold themselves for to 
you know, made, made their packs with celestial beings. It's not all with nefarious ones. Yeah, she's she's like a good person. She just, you know, doesn't think about other people. <laughs> right, yeah. She's not malicious and she's not inconsiderate of other people, but it just doesn't cross her mind. Valandar says his next warlock is going to have a patron that is his more powerful self from the distant future. That's interesting. I wonder what kind of thing your future self would require you to do that you don't want to do. Because right? a, a warlock inherently, you have to give something up to get something. So if you're giving something up to get something to your future self, what are you giving up? Zach says, Charlie Brown's sister. She's monofocused on Linus and would definitely join a pact to have Linus. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah, whatever it is that she made this pact for, it was <laughs> it was probably that short-sighted. Just like, give me this person or give me this like thing that I really want right now. Right. But but wouldn't necessarily want. Valandar says, by raw, you've already fulfilled your end of the bargain at the start, and there are no rules that the patron can take back the magic. There are still aren't rules that the patron can't, at least not that I have read. Maybe there is. I don't know. Either way, just because it happened in backstory doesn't mean it didn't happen. So what did your future self force you to give up, right? Like, what, what did they require? What did you have to sacrifice? Because just because you haven't done it yet for role play reasons doesn't mean it didn't happen. And I think you're missing a prime role play opportunity to engage in that as a longer term sacrifice than just the initial one. I think they make that rule to avoid DMs from bullying players in in ways that they wouldn't enjoy and uh, more than they make it for logistical sense. Logistically, so, you should... The, like, the warlocks have to have back, books, right? No. They, they have, have to, to have... Well, have Pact of the Tome. Oh, warlocks. Pact of the Tome has to have yeah. books. Right. Okay. Zach says, yeah, my warlock has a pact with a deity who's the polar opposite of the warlock's nature. Uh, Valandar says, I like the seed of magic idea. Patrons are all immortal and lose nothing by placing a teeny bit of power into mortals. Eventually the mortal will die and the magic will return to the patron multiplied exponentially. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. That's a cool idea. Yeah. He'd have to have a good reason to take it back, not just siphon it. But also, you know, like a college, they're going to require you to demonstrate you're going to make good use of it from their perspective, what would be good use of that, right? Colleges, getting into college is all about a demonstration that you're willing to stick through it. Because the first first year in college, colleges don't really profit. It's not, they start, they begin the profit in your second, third, and fourth year. So, although it's not really entirely true anymore because they usually have adjunct professors teaching the lower stuff, but higher level colleges when you're going in for masters and stuff. So, yeah, anyway, I mean, and then the same thing with when you finish college, you go to college to prove you are, for most, for most careers, you're going to college to prove the dedication you're willing to put into a career. You learn some things along the way, but it's primarily a demonstration of willingness to put forth effort. Yeah, oh, that's a lengthy thing. But warlocks, they don't want to do that, right? They don't want to put in effort for years. They want it now. And they don't care how. Don't care how. I want it now. Valandar says, the previous campaign I was in, we had a warlock whose married patron had literally adopted him off the street. She was like a worried mother and she gave him his powers to keep him safe when he left home to make friends 
demands constant updates on how he's doing, demands he remembers a coat in cold weather, and make sure he eats properly, etc. Yeah, I think that's fun. But not what we're going for with this model, right? We're going for a more traditional, generic, totally willing to make short-term sacrifices for long-term gain caster. A model that when you pick it up, you think, this is a warlock. But she's not an evil warlock because she's packed of the unicorn, right? Right, yeah. yeah. No, she's not evil. Very similar to to the Princess and the Frog character. She's not like a bad person. Yeah. She cares about Tiana and her happiness and stuff. She just like also <laughs> doesn't really think about other people very much. Doesn't think about how her actions impact other people's happiness. She wants right, you to yeah. have that, and she wants to have her happiness, but cause and effect are largely lost. Yeah. Valendar says, wait, what do you mean can't have a boyfriend? Yeah. I imagine, like, this girl's dad is maybe, like, one of the merchant guild leaders or, or like, mm. a, you know, one of the majority guild kind of leaders in the in the kingdom so he's got a lot of money and he spoils her because he 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 just wants her to be happy now pact of the unicorn isn't a real thing what would you envision Pact of the Unicorn to be? Um, I haven't really played a lot of Warlocks, but I did play Pocket. <laughs> Pocket was fun. <laughs> I enjoyed DMing Pocket. So like, I don't wait, know. We'd is have Lisa to... Frank, a unicorn patron warlock. <laughs> right. Do you need me to uh, beat up this bread dough over here? Ah, yeah. It's like been almost another hour. It hasn't been that long, but could just push it down. Yeah, just punch it down. Cover it with the. Uh, towel afterwards. Here, I'll just bring you this. Do what you're going to do to your bread dough. And I'll go put a towel over it. Oh, okay. So but like, that's We're going to have to deal with that like pretty shortly. Legit impact. Punch down. Right, yeah. yeah. Do you have a towel already out here somewhere for this? Yeah, the, there's a Mickey Mouse towel. Where do I find the Mickey Mouse towel? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, I put it down somewhere, and I was mindless when I did it. So. Got it. Well, there's uh, there is one in the oven drawer thing. So I'll, put, I'll use that one. Oh, I see dessert, the strawberry thing. Yeah. Mm. Is that like Cool Whip or Whipped Cream? Uh, I don't know. Oh, you bought it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I cut up the strawberries to make the bullseye I pattern see. on top, but it's a coconut cream pie. Got it. Whatever that means. Balandar says, Pact is the type of Pact patron would be celestial and unicorns are considered celestial. She could be Pact of the Tome with a unicorn patron. Ah, okay. So you just pick any kind of Pact you want. And then you say, yeah, and my celestial patron is a unicorn. Got it. So it is a thing. I told you it was a thing. You didn't believe me. No, because 
every time you say that, it's some homebrew thing you found. <laughs> and you are convinced it's... Uh, and then it I go and I look at it. It doesn't matter if it's like, a homebrew thing because it can be a thing. That's the point of D&D. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> but then you're like, no, this is official D&D stuff. Okay, there's a difference. I agree. You can use whatever homebrew you want. In my experience, far too much homebrew is uh, not focused on the story. It's not focused on... Um, interesting role play. It tends to be focused on. I saw this anime, and this god tier character was based off of this, and so I want to make that in D and D. And then you have a character that is so powerful it does not create any useful role play situations. And in yeah, order to challenge them, fair. you have to present them with overpowered baddies. Now, that's not true of all homebrew. There's some really good stuff out there. Pathfinder was originally just homebrew. Technically, still qualifies as that. And it was really good stuff. So our stuff is homebrew. I like it. I'm proud of the, the, the things we've created. Me too. But in general, you got to be leery. So what I really want to capture about, this is, a, this is my reference photo I'm pulling from here, what I really want to capture about her body type is this very elongated limbs and kind of the bony uh, joint areas, like the Hold shoulder. Hold on a second, we got a commercial. Oh. Ads. Oh, that was a cute puppy. <laughs> I'm not sure everybody sees the same ads, but there is a five commercial ad break. So if you are wanting to go do something with your bread, you got another minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will be back shortly. Oh, don't, don't die, please. Okay. You spent 15 seconds of that getting out of your chair, so... <laughs> uh, Zach says he doesn't see the commercials now, but other people still do, so we'll just wait a bit. Christy went to go tend to bread. Uh, reading chat to you, though, Christy, it says, uh, we went back to AD&D, you know, the first generation. It was brutal with holes you could drive an 18-wheeler through. Therefore, homebrew can be awesome. As Kyle says, ignored the OP stuff uh, for the story homebrew. Valandar says D&D was originally homebrew. Greyhawk and the Forgotten Realms were originally homebrews. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a... There's a different... There's so much content out there now that deciding which pieces to bring in can be challenging. It's good if you have a, a group of people or a company that is putting out content that... Uh, I don't like the word balanced. It's one of my big pet peeves about 5th edition. I don't care if it's balanced. What I care about is, are there interesting strengths and interesting weaknesses to any given class? And I think that is the critical part. Do I have my own niche that I can fill? Uh, that when sitting around the gaming table and something happens, I have a unique way that speaks to my character and who and what they are uh, to solve that problem? Or is this something I'm particularly vulnerable to and I am therefore dependent on my comrades and fellow players to uh, shore up that weakness? And I think that w that's what makes for a good class. Um, obviously, you don't need god tier powers you know you don't need to be running around throwing fifth level spells at first level uh i i don't like the standard power break being at fifth level i don't like that everybody scales at the same time i think that is a negative to fifth edition i'm just monologuing here while christy's making bread uh <laughs> because the commercial started i don't like that uh you don't have a I think it robs what you had in first edition, which was 
everybody has their chance and time to shine. You know, maybe maybe when you're all third and fourth level, the fighter is really just doing a lion's share of that work. But suddenly, when the wizard starts to get you know other spells, maybe they pick up a sleep spell because you know back in first edition you had to roll for your spell. You didn't just get to go pick it. Uh, and so if you got a really good spell, then you had a chance to shine early on. If you got a particularly non-combat useful one, uh, your time to shine was not in the battlefield, which, let's be fair, first level wizards never shined in the battlefield in first edition, no matter what your spell was, other than maybe sleep or chromatic or color spray, chromatic orb, whichever one it was that was really powerful. So that's my monologue. I think we've lost the... Uh, the varied strength, but uh, Valandar says, yeah, that wasn't how it actually played out any time I played first edition. Wizard was literally useless until around fifth level, and everyone else was literally useless after that. That was not my experience. <clears throat> I played a lot of first and second edition, but a second, I think, was more, was better at that. Second edition was a little more flexible. And I think offered a little more strength, a little more balance, but not too much balance. And I think that's the direction that it went after that, was too much balance. Second, I think, was the sweet spot. It's okay, though. It's easily, uh, if it's your interest, it's really easily recreatable in modern D&D, &D, just by virtue of magic items or uh, tweaks or other homebrew. You can, you can adjust. Oh, I have to go look at bread, and I will be right back. I don't have a good intermission screen, so you don't get one. And Christy is on her way back right now, and I have been relegated to... Uh, Okay. Bread stuff. <laughs> yes, bread stuff. Because um, it must be done. Okay. So Can you read chat from where you're at? Uh, Valandara says, yeah, that wasn't how it actually played out. Yep, I, I read that one already. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at Paris Hilton. What I want to capture about her anatomy here is the prominence of the bones uh, at the joint areas, like her collarbone and her shoulder bones are very prominent. Her elbows are a little um, knobby. She looks Things a like lot like you looked when we met, when you were dancing. Yeah, except like two foot taller. Right. <laughs> Maybe not two feet taller, but yeah. Um, she has, even this thinness carries through into her chest. She has kind of the bony sternum area. It's not really rolling out of the square shape very easily. Does it have to roll out of the square shape? Yeah, so we're making arrows. Oh. So they have to be long and thin. Okay. Arrows, huh? Yeah. Rob oh, we're having a Robin Hood dinner. Yeah. And that's why you wanted men in tights downloaded. Because anytime someone says Robin Hood, any of us that are over... 30 immediately go men in tights. <laughs> tight, tight tights. Tight. Got it. Which you did not download and I did, I did. not watch. <laughs> it's already downloaded. It's waiting for you. We didn't have time. Accusing me of not downloading it. <laughs> oh, shit. 
Um, Zachariah says Errol Flynn. I don't know who that is. Who are we talking about? You're joking, right? Are you talking to me? Yeah, you're joking that you don't know who Errol Flynn is. No, I'm not joking. Valandar says, I wouldn't have a problem with what you're talking about if the strengths and weaknesses existed at the same time. But when you have many, many months of gameplay where your character is detriment to the party, it's not fun for me. I agree. Yeah, that's true. Errol Flynn, Valandar says, the greatest Hollywood swashbuckler of all time. You know who he is. Google Errol Flynn. It's not Errol Flynn. It's Carrie Elwes. You, what's wrong with you? No, it's Errol Flynn. It's absolutely not. It's Carrie Elwes. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> it's, it's not. It's Errol Flynn. He's right. He's not right. He's right. Oh my god. Yeah. I'm gonna no. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie Elwes isn't. Carrie really... Elwes, Robin Hood, Men in Tights. We're not talking about. Oh, I didn't understand. Yes. Yes, Men in Tights is Carrie Elwes. <laughs> Look up Carrie. Look it up. I think it's absolutely <laughs> Carrie I... Elwes. <laughs> I did not realize he was saying Errol Flynn was in Robin Hood Men in Tights. I, d I don't think so. I don't think that's what he meant. But Carrie Elwes looks a hell of a lot like this guy. How do you not know who Errol Flynn is? I've never seen this man, though. I mean, he was done long before oh, Robin I Hood see. Men in Tights. You must have played Robin Hood here. Oh, I think I did see this movie. I'm sure that you did. Errol Flynn was, yeah, he was Robin Hood before. And he does like the big crash there. landing into the banquet hall. And he swings on the wooden chandelier. Uh, I think you're thinking of a movie that they acted out, Robin Hood. But yes, I think that that happens. Okay. Yeah. I don't think you're thinking about the right movie. I think you're thinking about the making of another movie that featured that scene. But that is yeah. a scene. <laughs> okay. Probably. Yeah, I need like 2000s Paris Hilton. Not like now Paris Hilton. Oh, yeah. That's fair. There's a difference. Okay, all of your arrows are not going to fit on this baking sheet. I got two baking sheets. There's one underneath it. Oh, okay. She has like, I don't know, like almost no hip, really. Like her hips are very narrow. That was gross. Nope. <laughs> uh, yeah. Here is. Uh, let's see. Zach was saying, I was saying Flynn was the OG Robin Hood is all. Exactly. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Valandar says, yep. And Zach says, she's a twig. Yeah, she had the same body style you used to have. What used to be your, your ideal body style, which, is, while still pretty, I like the more feminine style that you have now <laughs> than the wireframe good save good save i mean i have pushed you to develop the body that you have now so one would think that i probably like that <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I don't like the lack of musculature. I don't particularly have a preference on bone style, but I don't like just the weakness that has become glorified in women today. But I think this, I think this body type is very. Um, it's very warlocky. Right, like it's very indicative of her character in that she's never really worked. Yeah, it's perfect for anything in her life. <laughs> yeah, I'm not knocking it for this model. It's perfect for this model. Truth be told, one of the main reasons that I picked this model to work on today uh, of all of the set was one, because I, I already had her character very fleshed out in my head and I knew what reference I wanted to use for it, so it made it easy. But the other reason was because my daughter has been on me to sculpt a unicorn girl <laughs> for like a month and I finally showed her that I had designed a unicorn girl for her and she was like I want to paint it now and I was like it's not I haven't made it yet you can't paint it because I haven't made it yet <laughs> and she was like no but I want to paint it on your computer and I'm like no it, there's nothing to paint I haven't made it yet <laughs> in her mind there's not a difference between the 2D sketch up and the 3D render of a model. Uh, yeah. Zach says, curvy is cool, fit is forever. And Valandar still says, I still say these five deserve a webcomic. Dude, that would be so cool. Because that's what you have time for. <laughs> Make it happen, Valandar. <laughs> For some reason, I thought I would find a lot more pictures of her, like, holding her Pomeranian. Mm. Because I feel like that was on every, <laughs> on every channel when they talked about Paris Hilton. It was always, like, her with a bag or her holding the little Pomeranian. Right. I'm not sure that we want to do spell effect on the model. No? I'm not sold. Okay. Is it essential for the composition? Um, I mean, something should be kind of balancing this foot, but it, I'm open to other suggestions. What about just doing her hand open like she's holding something and the implied spell effect? It's yeah, a little more of a throwback than the modern day actually sculpt the spell effect, but... I'm down with it. That's fine. Also, in your uh, concept art, she's got very much this this pose going on, right? But in yeah. your sculpt, you have this. Yeah, it's because the Z spheres don't like yeah. being too close. You might need to. I, I gotta move it, but okay. So that's already planned. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what do I do with this bread now that it's all? Um, is the oven heated? It made a bunch of sounds, so yes. So yes. Um, you could just pop that into the oven. Now do I put them both in at once, or do they need? You can put them both in, that's fine. I also kind of like, um, so this set is is for our setting, Valoria, which um, is a very classic sort of medieval fantasy setting. But now they can hear me scream again. Uh, yeah, I think it's safe to call it Stormwind, right? Like, 
that was the epiphany moment when we were talking about what was missing. And you were like, like a storm wind. I was like, yes, like storm yeah. wind. So it's a human capital city. Um, and if you play World of Warcraft or know anything about the Warcraft lore, it's very much a storm wind esque city. Uh, sorry, I got distracted with this anatomy issue. Um, and they have a, uh, an army, obviously. And these girls are some of the elite. Um, I don't, I don't know. I gotta check my phone. Some of the elite guardians. Uh, It goes in for Oh crap, take it out. <laughs> Actually it's okay because we let it rise for a little bit longer. It's okay. Bake it for like twelve minutes. It it says to check them after like five minutes and see if you need to rotate the pan. It says to check it after five minutes and see if you need to rotate the pan because they're pretty thin. I forget what I was saying. <laughs> Something about Valoria. I think that the leg was just facing the wrong direction. It was broken. And now it's not broken. What was I saying, guys? <laughs> I st oh, you guys didn't tell me. Okay. Thanks, then. Uh, so Valoria is like a capital human city and they prize and value people who adapt, evolve, and embrace uh, the current phase, whatever current phase they're in. Season basically, right? Um, yeah, so a lot of our other settings, like Australia and Embermore, are very specifically themed around a particular season. And this is kind of a more neutral location in that it experiences all the seasons. So one of the struggles we had when looking for how to sculpt and add basic humans into our line was, well, they've been done so heavily, right? Everybody's got humans. But also, where do they live? What's interesting about them? <clears throat> and we decided to go with the very heavy, tropish humans are flexible, right? They are short-lived and hardy and flexible. So this is also a big thing for Christy. Where, uh, where I would live in Hawaii for my whole life, if given the opportunity. Christy would hate that. Because without fall, winter, summer, uh, 
Christy's unhappy. She wants days where it's too hot to go outside. She wants days where you go outside and you come back in and you're freezing and sit by a fire. She likes that contrast. So my pitch to her was let's have a place where that is the philosophy of the people that live there, that they like, cherish, and enjoy the volatility of the climate. And that we have all these places that are perpetually uh, a particular season, and it's very magical in nature, the reason it's that way. Uh, and depending on which other uh, locale is more dominant at the moment, determines which way the seasons in uh, Valoria go. So if, um, if, if Wintervale is flaring, for lack of a better term, it's going to be very cold, and if the, so if the winds are blowing from Wintervale, right, it's going to be super cold, everything is going to freeze, uh, and, and it's hibernation mode for everything that's there. Uh, but also, on the flip side, if it's coming from, uh, say, Estrella, which is all spring, that's when everything is going to bloom more heavily. Not just the winds will blow, but in a magical way, uh, plants, vegetation will take off and, and, and do very, very well. So we're balancing and still theory crafting some of this other, the other impacts of which way the seasonal winds are blowing. But uh, we wanted to have both a natural, real life feel to it, but also a magical one-two punch with it, right? So, yes, it's spring. Things are growing. But uh, the wildlife tends to take on a little more of a... The, the plant life takes on a little more of a mind of its own when the winds are blowing from Estrella. Uh, not to the point that you have full-on nymphs everywhere and all this other stuff, but a little more, you know, talking to your plants makes a really big difference when the winds are blowing from Estrella. Obviously, this, you know, feeds into their religion and their just cultural mindset. And so we're, we're kind of exploring all of the ways that this hyper-focus on adaptability and mental flexibility would impact a society. I was actually watching a documentary on uh, how to foster mental flexibility um, as this is important for my work, right? Not to get too hung up on one solution or uh, method of solving a problem. I need to intentionally foster adaptability. One of the things that I learned was that the human brain is often set in a lot of ways from the time we're like six months old. It's already, we're already kind of solidifying those uh, synapse pathways. Which is really interesting. I didn't think it would be that early in life. It's, a, it's an interesting thing because you were watching those videos and it bled over into my uh, morning philosophical reading and video watching. So I'm perpetually humbled by the perspectives of the big thinkers of 
the world, which I think we should all be, right? Like, I enjoy watching anybody or listening to anyone who thinks for a living, even if I vehemently disagree with their perspectives. Not so much the people that are propagandists, right? They're just out there to push a particular agenda, but the people that are actually thinking about stuff, oh, it just it tickles my fancy. So I'll spend at least an hour a day just listening to excerpts or sometimes entire speeches from from these folks like and it's i don't limit it to just one side of a political spectrum or anything like that because i think that's just silly uh <clears throat> you, you there are intelligent people all over the place that think wildly different things so um but i noticed that this morning i had two videos that popped up one was a uh Neil deGrasse Tyson video on uh, nature versus nurture, which led heavily into what you've been looking at, early stage development and defining who you are going to be. Right. And one from Jordan Peterson on, uh, actually there were three, one from Jordan Peterson that was on um, uh, the conflict that can be created if the conflict that can be created in a person if they are uh, um, pushed to be something very different than they are and what ramifications that can have which uh, and vice versa if you are um, pushing a child without really understanding their perspective and that takes place I think on both sides of everything where people, you know, one person really wants their child to be this successful entrepreneur, blah, 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 blah. And somebody else is pushing their children in very different directions. They, you know, I think you've got people that want their children to be media stars and, 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 and such. I think both of them can impact what happens to that child. But I just thought that was really interesting that Big Brother was watching the videos you were watching, and then suddenly my feed was inundated with related content. Right, it was like, here, teach her this. All right, your bread is out of the oven and looks decidedly bread-like. Awesome. That's what I always wanted. Bread-like bread. Anyway, I think it's taken a long time for me to get things like Twitch to show me thought-provoking videos instead of propaganda. Well, not Twitch, yeah. but like um, uh, tw not like YouTube or whatever. YouTube and um, the Chinese one that everybody's all up in arms about. Uh, TikTok. TikTok. Yeah, to get it to show me what I wanted it to show me instead of what it assumed I wanted to see. And I thought that was very interesting, too. It assumed, based off of the first video that I watched from beginning to end, that that was for sure what I was into. <laughs> and that it was... Uh, about the political bend of the video, not about the content. And so I was getting a very one-sided thing from those for a while, which irritated me. And I had to actively go and seek out other perspectives on that platform and force myself to sit through sometimes brain-numbingly bad content <laughs> to convince it that but I want to see the actually good content on the other side of this. Uh, but over a prolonged period, it's, it's, it's adjusted. It's adapted. I'm not getting so many vapid speeches from either side and a lot more. Uh, I say either side because that's just how it seems to p compile its algorithms, right? Do you want liberal or conservative content? It seems right, to be yeah. the predominant main factor. And it really took some convincing that I wanted both. <laughs> it's like no you don't 
yeah, that's exactly it. It's like, no, you don't really want that. When you're looking for when you're looking for the opposite side, what you're actually looking for is incriminating evidence. So here's some incriminating evidence. Carefully added incriminating evidence of the other side. No, that's no. <laughs> Not what I meant. Yeah, Zach says, of course I'm watching the, er, Big Brother is watching. What are you watching? How else to keep track of you? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that was one of the things that the psychologist was talking about for fostering mental flexibility is going out of your way to ensure that you're not encasing yourself in an echo chamber mm -hmm. of like-minded thinkers that you consistently expose yourself to things out of your out of your comfort zone or things that challenge your your current state yeah which can be an uncomfortable experience right but i think when you embrace that uh mentality or approach it can it can lead to really good things such as just being much more firm in your own convictions like once you've decided something it's because you have put it to the test and have challenged it many many times you are far less insecure about your position because it, you've tested all the other positions <laughs> well one of the things i found particularly interesting recently and we're turning this into a philosophical show but we'll, so we'll stop that Sorry. shortly but it's relevant because we're world building and so studying these things uh matters uh in on this one along the lines of what you're saying it was also uh they were talking about the difficulty in being flexible of mind one of the ones you were watching um was talking about how for there, there's a sweet spot of intelligence where it's easy to be flexible of mind. And right. Uh, it was a Nobel Prize winner who was quoted as saying that he's not a genius, that he surrounds himself with geniuses, but that uh, geniuses tend to be very rigid in their thinking because they're not wrong very often. They're just very intelligent people, and so they are used to being right. And so they just assume that they're right. And so... They can get locked in a track of thinking because they thought that, and the first thing they thought is probably right, and it probably is. Right. Right, right. like not inaccurately, right? They, they just are <laughs> right very often. Um, but because of that, they're less willing to change their mind once they've decided something and that is uh kind of the death of mental flexibility but then on the flip side of that people that are uh, people that are of low intelligence are never accustomed to being right about anything they think knowledge is basically unattainable so they don't adapt flexibility of mind because they believe belief is a choice that you're just picking what you think is true not what makes sense because nothing right. makes sense to them so you get low enough on the intelligence scale and they stop believing that facts are a findable thing and in the middle are these people <clears throat> that know that facts are findable things but also are aware that that's a difficult thing for them to do and they are willing to go oh i guess i was wrong about this maybe this is the right one nope not that's not it either oh okay here it is and that you can acquire actual knowledge that is empirical, not uh, okay. personal, subjective. And of course, all knowledge is subjective, and you know, blah blah blah. blah. But there's that unfortunate mixture where you have the very high end, um, high brain power required <laughs> concepts, like that. The fact that all knowledge is subjective and then you have people of low intelligence that hear that and just think so that means you can't know anything nobody actually knows anything well yes and no right we have a common perspective as humans 
that we can know knowledge from, right? We can know that all humans are going to be impacted by this in this way consistently. Uh, I really like what Neil deGrasse Tyson said about this. He's like, look, we started out with, you know, uh, pre-Newtonian physics where you drop something, it tended to go down, and that was very dependable. Newton came along and he came up with laws for that. And then we came, and Einstein comes along and disproves Newtonian physics at the extremes. Now, that doesn't actually mean Newtonian physics are wrong. They work just fine for describing our day-to-day -day world. It just doesn't describe things well when you're moving the speed of light through space and dealing with other stuff that you're not going to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't matter to you. And then after that, we get advanced particle physics and new quantum mechanics that start to exceed Einstein's perspectives and start to prove him wrong in some ways. And it doesn't actually prove Einsteinian physics wrong. Because it works for everything Einstein was trying to define. It just doesn't work for other new things. And the rules, quote unquote, are, excuse me, eternally undefinable. But you can absolutely predict how fast an apple will fall. That is knowledge that you can have. And you don't need Einsteinian physics to describe that. You just need Newtonian physics. So you can be wrong, technically. And still get the right answer. <laughs> and still get the right answer, yeah. One would assume that we will probably continue that ad infinitum, right? We're probably never actually going to get the true mechanics of the universe worked out. We just can't perceive enough of it, both in depth and in volume. Anyway, so to bring all this back to how it relates to this, uh, this little village, this town, this city, uh, recognizing that, yeah, here is this very eclectic, um, weird ritual that every time the wind blows from Australia, you initiate this ritual. Well, what does the ritual mean? Well, they're all very pragmatic people. They don't think the, the ritual is in enacting some weird magic that's causing the crops to grow. But they do know if they don't enact this ritual, things go badly. They've tried it. And every time they try it, things go badly. It's not just superstition. It's the same way the farmer's almanac works. Right? You plant stuff in a particular phase of the moon. Why? Well, we don't know. It's irrelevant. You just do, <laughs> <laughs> you we, just do because it works. Okay? Yeah, that's exactly right. You plant these seeds this deep and this, these seeds this deep. These you point up, these you point down. Why? Well, because that's just what works. You could study it. You could probably try to learn. Maybe you could figure that out. But these people are very pragmatic. They don't really care. This ritual works. And so they do that ritual. And so now we're in the process of developing that lore of these people that are willing to hear new ideas and think about them and pragmatically put them to the test. They're very empirical people uh, who are willing to participate in the ritualistic because in the end a ritual is just a formula yeah to outsiders that might look like they're very superstitious folks but you won't find them you know not stepping on a crack because it might break their mother's back no they're not that's not a thing that's silly they tested it <laughs> My mom's back did not break. You're full of crap. Yeah, I think uh, the embracing the the truth, I guess, would be the best way to put it. The embracing the truth. the now is. It kind of comes in all aspects of life, right? Not everyone is cut out to be a doctor, but if you are and you have the propensity for that, like, great. If not, embrace who you, who you are, what you are good at, and make use of that. So... 
all of that to say that's kind of part of why I wanted to design all the girls in this set with very different body types, very different skill sets, um, to show sort of how people within this culture would use that set of values and morals and guiding principles and adapt that to their particular skill set or yeah. selves. Yeah. <laughs> With, with child rearing, there are a lot of different philosophies. The one we felt was appropriate for these folks uh, is a very um, analyze the child, figure out what, how the child is growing. And uh, I, I saw a guy who said this better than me. He said, you can't sculpt your child. You don't get to create it. You don't get to engineer your child. Your child is who they're going to be. And that has largely nothing to do with you. Their success at that, whatever it is that they're going to be, is very much related to you because the knowledge they will have available to them is going to be determined by what knowledge you gave them. So the head start in life that they can have is based off of how you empower them to be whatever it is they're going to be in the end and stop trying to direct your children to be one thing or another. That uh, the studies that they were doing were showing that, yeah, you know, when your child is six and seven years old, they're still 30, 40% what you're steering them to be. But as they continue to grow, virtually 0% by the time you're in your late 20s of who you are is because that's what your parents wanted you to be. Now, how successful you are at that, at your traits that you have, your inherent traits, that doesn't mean you, nobody's a doctor because their parents wanted them to be a doctor, but the traits that you have, your empathy, your you know every personality trait that you possess, you're born with, and what you do with that is determined by the environment you grow up in. And he made the statement, it's you're the shepherd of your child, not the engineer of your child. You get to choose what field the child grows up in, what, what field the sheep grows in, but you don't get to design the sheep. I thought that was really perfect for these people. Yeah. Uh, Zach says, I grew up with a classmate who was not a natural at music. She completely made up for it with effort, boatloads of effort. She totally deserved the success she earned. Absolutely. Uh, Christy and I were talking about that a while ago. I actually think that person has more potential typically than the super gifted idiot savant at music because the person who's naturally inclined to it lacks the fundamental logical understanding of what they're doing. And so when presented with something that is not intuitive to them, they don't know what to do about it. it it's the same, same issue we were talking about before, about the very smart people having uh, difficulties when they find themselves thinking something that is incorrect with jumping out of that thought process. But in this case, you don't learn how and why music works. Maybe some of them do, but the vast majority of them with a rich talent in something, they just do. And studying learn it is very counterintuitive. It's not how it works for them. So they're less capable of fixing fundamental problems in things of their venue because they don't have that uh, deep, rich, complete knowledge about how and why everything works. <clears throat> Zach says, exactly, I'm very natural with music, but I didn't have the drive at the time, so I only earned success intermittently. Yes, exactly that. And then when you make something that's not working, you just can't make that work, right? It just doesn't work. Whereas this other person by now would have a very, very, oh, well, you could fix that in like eight different ways. This would probably be the best one. Because they know all those eight ways. They've studied them. Valendar says, I used to want to be a chemist, and my sense of humor suffered at the time. I would only tell jokes periodically. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, Valendar cracks me up.
Zach says, in fact, I think her drive is ultimately one of the best lessons I had about what it looked like. I think you fall in the sweet spot, Christy, for art. Right? If you if you don't maintain and practice and study, your skills atrophy. We can see that with your sketches. As soon as you're not maintaining that skill and focusing on it, your default is not great. It's okay. Your vast knowledge will carry you somewhat, but your sketches get sloppy. They get hash marky. And uh, something you would never turn into a teacher. Yeah. Uh, something you would be embarrassed to have people see. Still communicates just fine, but you, you don't want that out there. You're ashamed of it. You hide it from me. <laughs> uh, but when you're focusing on it, you do quite well. You're not bad at art, but you're not super gifted at it, which forces you, through your passion for it, to hone, develop, nurture, and study that, for that skill which makes you, in my opinion, incredibly uh, proficient. And I think that's a good word that often implies less than stellar, but I don't think that's true. You're a fantastic artist, and you're proficient in, in a way that people that are naturally gifted at it don't tend to be. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Think. Well, you you get mad if somebody says you're gifted. You you start seeing colors. I can see it. That like uh, that swagger. That oh no, you didn't. That <laughs> starts to come out if somebody says you're gifted. Yeah, I I, I don't like that word. It it implies that uh, that the success is a lack of effort. It just comes naturally. Right, which is, which is what I'm getting at. There are people out there like that. It's not you. But I think the fact that it's not you comes with a rich benefit. I think you're, I think you're at the ideal point, right? You're, you're very good, but just shy of good enough that you don't have to work for it. Valander says, I've been working in the art field since 2001 and can honestly say I've only met one person who is innately talented. Everyone else has to work at it. Yeah. I think there are probably more innately talented people out there. But picture the life of somebody like that, right? You're innately gifted at this. You touch a paper and something beautiful comes out exactly what you want it to be. You are the Picasso of your time and then something presents itself that you struggle with eh, I'm, forget that I'm done <laughs> yeah. yeah we saw this little kid on YouTube the other day who was he was like four or five and he was playing Chopin and Tchaikovsky and all these great composers but playing the piano beautifully and I I thought I mean it's fantastic for this little boy what a great skill to have but also just like man where do you go from there <laughs> yeah it's a it's a lot to live up to also and I think there's like there's the meme that Artists are naturally gifted kids and troubled youth and then just disappointments as adults. <laughs> and I think, while that's not necessarily true, I do think that a lot of times as an artist you feel like you're a disappointment because people tell you, oh, you had so much potential, you, you are already so gifted at it, and they're just waiting to see what it is that you do with it. And if you don't feel like you do something world-changing, then you, you feel like a disappointment. Yeah, that kid had already done, he had already created three of his own compositions. Right, yeah. and he's four. <laughs> like, 
Uh, let's see. Zach says, my execution of art hides my knowledge of it. You're an art critic, Zach. Not everybody that knows is also capable of doing. It's very true in our household, huh, honey? <laughs> very true, yeah. Uh, Valendar says, my hero academia explicitly says in episode three, something earned through hard work is inherently worth more than something gifted by random chance. And he likes that thought. Yeah. Zach says, he worries about young ones getting thrust into that position. I think that's critical to what we want for the people of this, of this country, of this uh, keep. Uh, let's say you had that little kid, super gifted at music, but didn't particularly care for it. Modern culture would say, don't waste that gift. Study it anyway. Capitalize on it. Basically saying, be miserable because you're inherently gifted at this. But that's not going to create great music. Have I lost you? No, no, I completely agree. I'm just trying to deal with this hand. I'm sorry. Gotcha. I think... Um, so for these people, they might look for other ways that this child would be interested. How do you how do you find an adjacent or another task that this gift would uh, facilitate his success? I friggin' did the hand backwards. You sure did. Thank you, ZBrush. And the mirror capability. One of the many benefits to digital sculpting. Uh, Zach says, not an art critic, but I really feel I've done something with impact, and I want to positively impact people, uh, be it teaching or producing art. Well, both of those can positively impact people, and critiquing art can positively impact people. Uh, every one of our top-selling models, more importantly, the pieces people really like, because Mostly selling is people are voting, hey, I really like this, right? So it's not about money. Although money matters, it's not what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> Every one of our best-selling pieces are things that Christy made something or I had an idea and then we pushed back and forth at each other about the idea. So like um, Zariah, lots of people loved Zariah. It was a very, very high-yielding sculpt at the time. And, man, there was so much banter about that model. No, it should do this. No, it should do this. No, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to do that. Yeah, like this. Oh, like this. No, but try this. And as we've gotten better at that interaction, that also shows in the models. Uh, Kataka was another one of those where what Christy wanted for Kataka was good, but wasn't selling. It wasn't working. And it wasn't until I was like, look, stand here, stand like this, hold this hand like this. Now let me take a picture of you. Because this is how you stand in the living room when you're just idle. Kataka, the one standing on one foot, like pressing her arm to stretch her shoulder, is Christy at least five times a day. <laughs> like the one foot cocked up, resting on the side of the other thigh. That's, that's exactly how she stands. Fucking flamingo. <laughs> But uh, it worked, and the discussion 
when it finally was right, both of us had the same opinion. Okay, yes, this. Yeah, now we're there. This is it. Uh, Valander said, oh, Lordy. Hey, Al, almost play f I almost face planted. It's a bit early, but I think a nap is in order. Well, you should get some rest, Valandar. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. Zach says, I like contributing to concept art, but I don't really ever want fit the scenario, uh, the stereotype of those who can't critique. Oh, oh, here. Mike oh, did what? something horrible. Stop making sounds. When you Just talk, for you. it turns into chirps is it better now no hmm. how about now no are other people hearing chirps ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay wait now you're back okay my zach are you still hearing chirps zach said oof is it better? Nobody knows. That was terrible. Well, I'm sorry. That was terrible for you. <laughs> I'm sorry my voice was terrible for you. No. Uh, anyway, Zach was saying he doesn't want to be the type that those who can't critique. I guess that, yeah, I, I understand that um, fear, not wanting to fit that stereotype. He says, I'll rely on Christy to hear him. Oh, you want to ask them if they can hear me right now? Oh, can you hear Kyle? I can hear him now, and he does not sound chirpy, but... Is that just me? Zach says, yeah, I won't, I win won't settle ever. I'm going to get better. It's always good to get better. It's always good to push yourself. I don't think that um, inability to do should result in an inability to direct or contribute or critique. I think Ron is masterful at this. Ron's ability to sketch something is... Um, Non junior high school level at best. And he probably couldn't sculpt an egg or a ball. <laughs> uh, but he's a great director. <laughs> Ron's contribution to the mini miniature industry has been monolithic at minimum. He's an incredibly talented art director. He's able to see, understand, and communicate what could be better and what has potential. That is critical to Reaper's continued success. It's Ron. If you're wondering why Reaper continues to succeed, that's the. there are lots of people very critical, but in the end, for the part that they do that is actually producing miniatures, it's Ron's ability to do that, to see potential, uh, to see how things could be improved. And uh, to encourage artists to f produce more of the former and uh, grow on the latter with excitement. Zach says, yeah, I've worked with Ron for years. He's good peeps. I didn't know you worked with him. But I think he's a good example of what I'm talking about here, right? You're, it's, it's exactly that. It's, um, you don't have to be able to do to be able to critique. That's a misnomer. Uh, insecure people will tell you that that's not true, that you have to be able to do, that they won't listen to people that can't do it themselves. And I think there's a time and a place for that. You don't want to be a financial advisor if you can't manage your own finances. Don't listen to the guy who's got no money about how to manage your money. That's silly. Uh, but I think there are other things that are physical skill set based 
that are separate. If you uh, if you do, I'm trying to think of a good examples. A buddy of mine owns an auto mechanic shop. He's a mediocre mechanic at best, but he has three fantastic mechanics working for him. And he absolutely tells those mechanics which routes to take when they're working on things, because one, it's his shop, and two, uh, has a better view of the overall picture than the individual mechanic. He knows the financial status of his customers. He knows... Um, what they plan on doing. He's the one that's had those conversations. He has the whole picture. Whereas the mechanic just knows, well, this starter's bad. Zach says, I've done freelance with Reaper since about 99. And he just had a long gap due to reasons and stuff. Uh, but he's got Reaper to thank for a ton of his skills. Okay, so what have you done for Reaper? I'm totally curious. I want to see him. I got to know inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> Mostly mine. Did you take that bread out? Mm hmm. Okay. I should turn off the oven, though. You look appalled at the taste of the bread. Oh, okay. Zach says, painted some slapping paint jobs and done some good ones. So you have some stuff in their uh, gallery? All right, cool. Yeah, I think um, he says he's, he sent me a DM with it. There are lots of ways to contribute. I Obviously, I think it's better if you can do, if you're capable of doing. Uh, he says, I'm the gallery and in those display cases at the treasure store. Is that what Reaper's calling their store now? The treasure store? When we got there, it had just opened. Local to the warehouse Reaper game store. Ah, oh, okay. Versus the online store. Is the pizza restaurant open yet? He says, nope, I'm running paint club in there now. Woohoo, paint club. So wait, did they did they kibox the pizza store? Was it just too much of a ordeal to get the food service license or what happened? Or just a refocusing of goals? I've noticed that statement a few times lately. We are a miniature manufacturer. That's what we are. That's all we are.
Yeah, um, I think Ed was really pushing for the pizza place a lot. Mm. And perhaps without him, that could be. It's not going anywhere. Quite possible. It's such a cool idea, though. Yeah, it is. So my um, reference for the face on this character is this woman, Dickin Lockman. Um, I first saw her on the TV show Dollhouse, where she plays like a brainwashed uh, assassin. They basically like reset your memories every time you go on an excursion. Okay. And other than that, you just live in kind of a blank state. Um, and they have like this whole house that's just built around like kind of nourishing them in the most bland way. And then they program them for a mission. They go out, they complete their mission, and then they get brain wiped again. Mm. So she takes on various characters as she is programmed for the mission that she's on. Uh, and then eventually, of course, at the end of the show, they, they start realizing that they're being brainwashed and the girls band together to try to overthrow the evil corporation that's doing sure. it. But, yeah. but I loved her face because it's like, it's so different. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of Asian, kind of Middle Eastern, um, but very, even though it's so different in proportion, it's still very, very feminine and pretty and kind of has like a, a slyness to it. I don't know how to put that. It has that um, Southern California beach girl vibe to her face. Yeah, I guess that's fair. Which is perfect for what you're going for with this model. Also, I'm like really fascinated with the way that her eyelids are. <laughs> Trying to capture that is going to be very challenging, but hopefully rewarding because I think she'll she'll kind of look very high class, like spoiled girl.
And I don't know, maybe... Hopefully it will also help to convey the the sort of celestial magicalness of her character. Yeah. That, that she's of that kind time. of kind of not of this world. Which I think Paris Hilton has a bit of that too, where it's and and a lot of that is just a curated persona, but it's, you know, not part of the common folk. Mm-hmm. Very definitely curated, for sure. I like to use celebrities for um, like actors and actresses for face reference because you can find so many different angles of photographs, which can help you get the, the shapes in three dimensions much more accurately. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, ZBrush was not wanting to split this. Mm. I said, do it. Do it. Just do it. It's a very different face than you typically sculpt. I'm excited to see how it prints. Yeah, um, she has like these very softly rounded um, eyebrows, which I love because they are so, there's no like deep crease in the center. There's no signs of like struggling. It's just very kind of adult right almost painted on but not painted on yeah now you've taken a different approach lately with some of your faces this one included to uh, construction like the nose being a, actually a completely separate piece uh, what is it that you find that you gain out of sculpting that separately and attaching it versus having it be just carved out of the face? Uh, that's just something I'm experimenting with this time. I didn't talk about mental flexibility, but I, I try to just switch up my process and see if there are different approaches that work better for different situations. This one, I felt like getting the slope of her nose and the shape of it, mm-hmm. right, was a really prominent part of her face. And that I could control it better if it was just a separate piece as opposed to attached to everything else that's in the face. I could just manipulate that in an isolated way. 
I think uh, an interesting thing here is that this particular nose uh, resembles the way most women do their makeup to make their nose look, right? That very strong, narrow ridge on the front of the nose, and then they tend to shade right, the left yeah. and the right of that ridge that for most people doesn't exist. Most people have a huge knob in the middle of their nose. But she doesn't have that knob, which... Uh, which is, I think, part of what's creating that ethereal look, which is interesting. Oh, one of your classes for Reprocon is not currently approved. You should reach out to Ron before I forget. I'm saying it now because I'll forget. And find out what's up. Okay. Which one? I will double check. Competence with color. Okay. He's like, no, that was a disaster. Don't do that one again. <laughs> well, this time we have a very different plan. <laughs> for implementation. I also want to have a backup plan in case things don't go well for the uh, concept, which I think the concept will be fine. But if it doesn't, I want to have uh, pre-painted versions of all of that, of the, pap of the pages to show. So if a, if a group is struggling, we can just put forth a uh, demo piece so that we can still communicate. That's fair, yeah. So the concept of the class is going to be, um, the class is going to break up into four groups and try to organize themselves based off of skill. So you'd have uh, some very competent painters, a, a very competent painter in each group. And then all the way down, to, you know, Kind of going from, have you only ever won a certificate or you've never answered, all the way up to, hey, uh, have you won a gold? And trying to break it up where there's an array of those skills in each group. And then the first thing is going to be, each group is going to be given a, uh, a picture. And the picture has a, the color palette to use, but it's, it's a picture, right? It's a picture of a snake or a picture of a bird in the snow or whatever. And it's going to be showing how using different color palettes can impact the uh, a lot about what a piece is. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it evil? Is it malevolent? Is it uh, generous? Is it, is it a shyster? Is it, is it a, a, a caster? Or is it a rogue? Is what, what is this character? And you can say a lot about that with color. So... Each group is going to be given a color palette that will say something very different on the miniature that we've chosen. And then they will uh, map that out on a little piece of paper, painting it really generically. And then um, each person will get their own mini. And uh, so you'll have... I need to back this up because it's been a while since we talked about this. They all get each four, each of the four pictures, right? And they're each going to do each of the four minis. So what would happen would be the person who's not good at painting, like me, if I'm in the class, I'm going to go in and just do some blocking in. Boom, 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 boom. This one is supposed to have this color here, this color here, this color here. And then I pass that off. And I pick up the next one. And I block in the colors for the next concept. Uh, and... We all work on this together to get a whole bunch of minis painted pretty decently. Um, and then at the end of the class, the person who is the least capable will get to pick the mini out of those four that they want to keep and, and on up the scale. That way everybody gets something that they can tweak or whatever else. Uh, 
because you know it's nice to walk out of a class with a mini but in the end everybody should have a pretty solid idea about how to select a color palette that will communicate what they want to communicate and hopefully pick up a little bit of uh, tips from the other people at their table and um, yeah that's the generic format for the class. Did I miss something on that, honey? It's been a bit since we talked about it. No, I think that about sums it up. Mostly, I just want to show with that a lot of the effect that you can have on a mini can be made in terms of color. Oh, Zach says he wants to do a color class but he wants to do something that demonstrates how pigment biases affect mixing, et cetera. Now that, that's a class I want to take. Yeah, that would be really cool. Give me a class that talks about how this color orange will mix with this color green and what that's going to do. What, what happens if I mix this green with this green? What's that going to do? Like what, how are these pigments going to interact? Zach says he remembers hearing Christy mention she wanted a really in-depth color class. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is there's too much to say in two hours. That is the issue, isn't it? <laughs> and you don't really have two hours. You have an hour and 45 minutes, right? Because you still have to clean up and get the room ready for the next class. Uh, Zach says the color, the book, blue and yellow aren't green or something like that really opened my eyes about color mixing. Uh. What did it teach you? I'd have to check out this book. Mm -hmm. I was waiting to hear if Christy has heard of this book. I or have not. not. Ah, blue and yellow don't make green. So what did you learn from this book? If I buy this book, what can I expect from it? This sounds like Christie's kind of a book. He says it's for artist colors, but it was mostly a big paint swatch book. But the introduction pages talked about all paints having a warm or cool bias, regardless of where they were on the color wheel. Ah, yes. This is something that is very difficult to teach new painters. When you're like, get a cool red. They're like, what is a cool red? It's red. <laughs> or a warm blue. You can't, you can't have a warm blue, it's blue. Yeah, you can. But it's it's finding those, those ones that are like liminal swatches, liminal colors, where they're like, you're not quite sure which way they teeter. Zach says pigment bias, yeah. So I know that isn't enough for a class, so I wanted to flesh out exercises that teach it. I think that's a great idea. I think um, the ideal class would include a basic, uh, a small set of paints, like 30 paints or so, from Reaper's Lines that the, class, the students could go get uh, and that taught you how these colors mix and have paints picked out that give you the ability to cover most of the spectrum of what you might want to get. And mixing paints is a skill, and most people don't want to. It's why Reaper has the, so many colors, right? They just want to open up the bottle of canary yellow 
and have that be the color that goes on the model. But it inevitably doesn't because even if you're glazing and not wet blending, it's still kind of mixing with the color underneath it. So if you gave me a class that said, okay, these are the colors we're going to talk about. So we're going to teach you how these colors mix to get whatever color you want. I think that'd be a good class. I'd take that. Christy would probably take that. Yeah, I would. Then more to the point, we'd then go to the Reaper store and buy the colors that we didn't have. Zach says he put in to teach a kids class uh, that will allow for the chaos to happen while giving kids tools they can keep using to learn mixing freehand color choices and brush control. But I'll do that while encouraging them to be creative. I think um, one of the big Big, uh, we got commercials up. I don't think they can hear me. Can you hear me right now? I can hear you. Oh, Zach can hear because he's a subscriber. So, wahaha. I think one of the big things that we, uh, we thought about for us in the classes we teach is new painters and even veteran ones don't need to reinvent a palette we push reference material as artists so heavily on new and much more importantly, honestly, on veteran artists use fucking references, right? So what we fail to do is talk about color palette reference material. Find a picture that has curated color palette that really says what you want the colors to say and just steal it. Copy the color palette. That doesn't mean that it needs to be a picture of an elf if you're painting an elf, right? It, does, it can be whatever. If you want it to be a forest elf, though, you could just find a foresty scene that you really like the color choices. The colors in the picture. And then you incorporate those onto the miniature. Both in pigment, hue, value. And proportion. And proportion, yeah. Zach says, yes, if approved, my non-metallic metallic course will be a recipe class, but it will tell you how to choose a recipe. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it will not be a recipe class. Yeah. Zach says, last night I picked three random colors and made them work as a metal. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, Reaper was doing that uh, three-color palette challenge uh, a while back, and I thought it was a really fun challenge uh, for color mixing, getting people to just experiment with, like, establishing what they were able to make with a limited color palette, um, which I think people often don't, they just don't even try. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if you're limiting yourself to just three colors, then you have to. You have to try. Uber Emmis says, hi, cool talk. Welcome to the chat, Uber Emmis. Hello. Thanks for joining us. He says, topic, I should say. Zach says, Luca did yellow, red, and don't remember to paint a cheesecake figure, and the range was awesome.
Yeah, it's just a fun exercise. I like it. But his light volumes are fantastic anyway. Yeah. I also think it's important where this woman decides to put her makeup. She wears her blush. We can't see the picture you're talking about, by the way. Oh. So if you want to show us real quick. Um, I think here's a really good example. But she wears it, like, very high on her face. Mm-hmm. To shade her cheekbones to be higher than the than yeah to arm. really like over accentuate the height of her cheekbones. Zach says, "Yeah, that sounds like a nice new challenge for me to try to make three color palettes." Um, I have a method that I learned in art school for that, um, where you do a fifty-fifty mix of the colors and then add white and black. And then you do a 70-30 mix one way and a 70-30 mix the other way, both adding white and then black. And that gives you a, a nine, nine swatches of colors. So basically from a two color minimum palette plus white and black, you have nine hues that you can use. Mm -hmm. Zach says, yeah, that's how I tend to do my mixing. Now, you paint as you sculpt, which I don't see other sculptors do. Did you want to talk a bit about why you do that? What's the purpose of this? Um, well, it serves a couple of purposes. One... I like doing it. <laughs> I like seeing the final character kind of come together. Uh, that's, that's a really critical thing, right? Your enjoyment of the process, you should never turn under to get a little more alacrity. Like just being a little bit faster is not worth sacrificing your enjoyment because your enjoyment will be directly reflected in the quality of your product. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Actually, before I go further, I wanted to talk to you. Uh, this is the human settlement, um, which is like the melting pot, right? They're always trying to have new experiences, try new things, meet new people, like expose themselves to a diversity of topics so that they can adapt and be the best version of themselves. But so it does tend to be kind of a a, a melting pot of a place. Mm -hmm. I think with the body structure and type of this character, we could make her an elf and it would fit. However, we could just as easily make her human and keep the whole thing human. And I think there's valid points to both of those sides. And I wanted your opinion. I want to do elves. I want to do elves here, and I want to do Wintervale elves. I want elves, particularly okay. elven female models. But I think it can be its own set. Okay. So, so let's keep this one human. And Yeah. Okay. Now, we can always leave the hair in such a way that if somebody really wanted to use this model as an elf in their game, like you said, she already says elf quite a bit. Yeah. We are going to have to go pretty soon to go get kids, so we should start looking for a raid. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to put ears and hair on this model super quickly and put it on the figure so you can see what all we've been working on today. But Zach says... Uh... I put three down, do the 50-50, pulling the colors down. Then I had a 70-30-ish as needed. He says, but I do that per color area, so I end up with about seven to 12 paints on a figure. Uh, so reducing all of the mini down to three colors will be interesting. Oh. Ah. 
if you want to look at uh, just how effective you can be with a limited palette, uh, award-winning painter Michael Proctor for quite a few years used a very limited palette on everything he did, the same limited palette, and he became so gifted with that palette. You like the word gifted there, right? Almost like he was born with it, but not really. He just spent several years using it until he had mastered that uh, the usage of those colors. Yeah. He says, yeah, I know Proctor's palette. That is... I know, <laughs> I know Proctor's palette. Proctor purple, right? I think that was actually a color in Reaper's paint line at one point was Proctor purple. Yeah, they they did make it. I don't know that it stayed in their line or if it was just a limited run thing, but they did make it at some point. He says he and Aaron kind of influenced each other over the years. Yeah. But I've always been so incredibly impressed with what Proctor could do with such a limited palette. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that's kind of a chicken and the egg sort of thing. He probably wasn't always that good with that palette. Just using it frequently and often, he became intimately familiar with what those colors would do when he mixed them. Well, and the specific paints he's using, right? He probably tried a variety of different purples and greens to mm -hmm. see what worked well together and which particular pigments he liked the reaction of. Mm -hmm. um, and then used that a lot so that he could really experiment with different ways of utilizing it. Um, yeah, exactly. Zach says, I think it was limited because I can't find it now. Yeah, probably was. Zach says, the first ReaperCon he ever came to, yep, he was good at it then. <laughs> But you can see the improvement over the years. You can tell the difference between something he painted this year and something he painted 10 years ago. And he's broken away from it recently. Christy called him out one year. Don't blame me for that. I blame you. He was visibly offended when she called him out. Zach says, good call out, actually. Yeah, no, he was... Uh, he had a moment of shell shock when Christy called him out on his color palette. Whether he wasn't expecting that from Christy, or he just wasn't expecting to get called out about it or hadn't thought about it, I have no idea. Yeah, I thought I was going to have to be bringing apology gifts for a while. Zach says, shaken up, yeah. Proctor has that demeanor, though, where you cannot tell if he doesn't like you or not. You might think he doesn't like you, and then you realize he's the exact same way to everyone else. So now you have no idea. <laughs> Zach says that he hears hymns like that, too. Uh, 
I love this purple. It's like such a 90s cartoon look. I don't know. Zach says, smiling hurts. I joke. <laughs> it is a 90s cartoon purple, yeah. Definitely not a Proctor purple. No. I also just really find it interesting how different artists can take a very similar palette and do such different things with it. Yeah. Like um, Brush for Hire, he tends to stick to a very cool color palette, like purples and blues, um, and very much on the cool side of the of those hues. Um, which could be interpreted very similarly to like a Proctor style palette, but what he does with it is so different. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, Uber Emmer says, is this about Michael Proctor, the miniature artist, Clever Crow? Yes, that's yes. who it's about. His work is insane, and he is incredibly generous with his time. He's the one that oversees most of the stuff for the uh, Reefer MSP Open. And uh, that is a five and a half jobs, right, all by itself. That's a, a nightmare. Yeah. And I, he doesn't get anything from that other than he does it. Uh, Zach says he has an infinite energy, but it's an inf it's not like a Aaron Lovejoy energy, because Aaron Lovejoy has like an infinite, over bubbling, about to explode level of energy. Michael Brockster <laughs> just has this like old school steam locomotive, consistent, unstoppable energy, but it's just chugging along. <laughs> Zach says exactly. Aaron is a rat terrier and Proctor is an exolerable bulldog. Yeah, there you go. Inexolerable. I mispronounced that. Yes, good description. I know it's going to break your mind, but I think the breasts need to move a little higher on the body to try to imply the more elfishness nature of it. Because we don't want to make her an elf, but closer to an elf. And I look at your concept art, and I think that's one of the big differences you have going. <laughs> Zach says, and Jason is a pug at heart. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, it's actually smaller if higher. Yeah, smaller and higher up. Uber Emmer says, really loving the stream, feels a bit more to lean towards the art and knowledge part of painting. Oh, thank you. Um, our stream gets kind of <laughs> random I guess uh, we don't really set out with a with a topic but we usually end up focusing on one thing or another that's related to the project mm -hmm. uh, you can catch Christine on her own stream most days Moonlight Minis uh, yeah and we'll be back over there on Friday, and actually, Aaron Lovejoy will be joining us mm -hmm. this Friday. And you'll get to hear a lot more uh, painter versus sculptor, what we think about, how we approach things, how, how we plan for each other and accommodate each other. 
Um, so if that is a topic you'd be interested in, definitely join us on our channel on Friday. You follow her there in chat. That's where she is. And give Miniature Monthly a follow. There are all kinds of different artists who stream here. Uh, you have um, Aaron Lovejoy, of course. Uh, his very talented wife, I assume, probably also streams here sometimes, though I haven't caught her yet. Uh, let's see. Jeff Davis, he streams here. Really talented artist and probably one of the most chill people. <laughs> Oh, That's he's not doing it on the stream anymore? I think he's doing it once a month on the stream too, Zach. The channel is Lovejoy's, but he's got quite a few people that come over here and do little cameo episodes. Well, I'm really happy with my face. I really captured what it was that I liked about that girl's face um, in the face that I made. Yeah. I think the head might be a tad big currently, yeah. although, you know, every time we too. say that, we print it, and then it's not, but I think it might be on this one, just because she's supposed to be taller, right? Yeah. Zach says he does think you got the essence of the face. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's the hard part, so <laughs> I'm glad I did that. Very Who different than your concept art, but very similar to the, the model that you picked. Yeah, it was what I was going for in the concept art that I was not happy with in the mm. concept art and was really hoping that I could get right in the sculpt, the, and I did. So. The face and the concept art reminds me of a um, younger version of the the older lady from the Grinch movie. The Grinch's oh, girlfriend. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was also in that movie, the... Bad Moms mm -hmm. Christmas. I don't know her name, but she does have a very distinct look, doesn't she? She does. I don't know her name either. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody, for the discussion and uh, hanging out. I think we will raid... Well, Jimmy the Brush is always a good go-to this time of day. Sounds good. Hey, you're very welcome. Uh, if you like Christy's work, you can find her on my mini factory. Let me get you a link for that. We try to stream here on Anne's channel like once a month. So we won't be back here for a little while, but. We will be back on our stream though. Yes. Like you said, twice a week we stream. If you 3D print, you can find Christy's stuff there. If you don't 3D print, you can find her on Etsy. And I'll find a link for that. Ooh, maybe this needs to be gold. Needs to be gold, yeah. So there's our Etsy store. You can order the physical models there. You can order uh, the STLs on my mini factory. Can raid up Jimmy the Brush. Please stick around for the stream. We have a small little group here. But every person counts and uh, interact a little bit afterwards, if you don't mind. It's good for both of their channels, both Miniature Monthlies and for Jimmy the Brush. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll see you next time. Got about eight seconds to say your goodbyes, babe. Goodbye, goodbye, da 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 da. <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys. Next time. <laughs> oh dear.
Mm-hmm. We're 